Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome on behalf of the Hudson Valley Food System Coalition. Um, I'm really, really, really excited that you're all here for our first iteration of Farm Bill Sessions, in which we're calling Farm Bill 101. Um, and yeah, I'd like to thank, uh, first and foremost, our core team of facilitators, uh, most of whom are here tonight. So we have Megan Larmer, who is a co-facilitator, Senior Director of Regional Food Programs at Glenwood. Uh, Sarah Brannon, uh, Director of the Milestone Mill. Uh, Kristen McPeak, who is the Vice President of Programs at the Community Foundations of the Hudson Valley. Uh, Styles Najek, who is the Community Food Security Liaison for Cornell Cooperative Extension Orange County. And uh, Marianne Johnson, who cannot be with us here tonight, but she is the Deputy Director for the Hudson Valley Agribusiness Development Corps. Um, I want to thank Hudson Valley Farm Hub for generously sponsoring this program. Um, and of course, the Vassar Environmental Cooperative uh, for hosting us here tonight. And how could I forget our panelists? Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. So today, you, we're just gonna be going over what is the monster legislative package known as the Farm Bill um, that tends to impact almost every part of our food and agricultural system um, and the way that it functions. And so the series is meant to give Hudson Valley stakeholders an opportunity to engage with the Farm Bill on a local level, yes, but so that we can connect our scale to the more federal level of food and agriculture, um, which is something that we as a coalition have been trying to do uh, for quite some time. I forgot I had a little mic in my hand and I'm not holding it. <laughs> um, so that being said, um, this is a series. So at the end of this session, I'll be asking for your input on what you would like to see in future iterations um, relating to the Farm Bill. So there will be a short survey, maybe four questions. If you um, select uh, different options, you might have more questions. Not intimidating whatsoever. Um, and that is going to help us craft uh, Hudson Valley Food System you know, list of priorities as they relate to the Farm Bill so that when October comes around and then um, you know, they're putting it into action and actually passing um, the bill, we'll have a stake in what actually then takes place when we come up for appropriations and we come up for rulemaking and we'll be ready to advocate and lobby as far as we can uh, on behalf of the stakeholders here in the Hudson Valley. Um, oh, and I'll also be asking how we can engage partners who are not here with us tonight um, how best you think we can engage, you know, um, food labor workers and other food system practitioners that we haven't really had um, a great, you know, uh, achievement at getting them through the door to these meetings specifically, but who have a stake in the legislation um, known as the Farm Bill. So, right. Um, before we actually begin with our program, I wanted to give a quick update. These are our beautiful facilitators. Um, on some coalition news. Um, so we have been selected as a part of a national program uh, creating a new community of practice as it relates to regional food policy councils. Um, and this is a project that is being conducted by the USDA AMS, uh, by Ohio State University, the John Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, and Colorado State University to help guide research and the creation of resources to support other councils, food policy councils, in taking regional approaches to food systems development over the next 18 months. Um, we'll be represented in the council by myself, by Megan Larmer, uh, and by Marianne Johnson. And through the project, we are being tasked to explore the importance of policy and collaboration that is aimed at regional food systems development um, as a means to minimizing policy gaps that typically stem from local policymakers and those you know, uh, constructed boundaries uh, that we've been kind of put into as uh, local legislations. And so highlighting the importance of co-governance um, and how us regional actors, what we can do in order to move policy forward. So this session in the Farm Bill generally is really relevant to that work. Um, we are one of 11 other regional food policy councils nationally that have been selected to take part in this program. Um, and these are kind of the guiding questions that they have set to us 
um, and parts of the project that we will explore as, as we make our way through um, the 18 months. So if you want to learn more about this, visit that website down there at the bottom, or you can ask me, you can ask Megan, you can ask Marianne if you're connected to Marianne, um, and we'll be happy to talk about what we've been up to so far. And so without further ado, I will pass to my colleague, Styles Nijet. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so I've been asked to read our land acknowledgement and then also uh, start the introductions. So I'll begin with my acknowledgement that we are gathered on the ancestral lands of many indigenous cultures on stolen land. For many of us, we are within the traditional territory of the Lenape Nation. I honor and respect the indigenous peoples who are connected to this land on which I live, work, and profit. I strive to create a food system that restores balance. We are all a part of a larger food system that is violently out of balance and entrenched in patterns of injustice. As we become increasingly aware of how we have benefited from these imbalances and continue to benefit, we will also become committed to learning and listening and to remaining in that uncomfortable space while we dismantle oppression. If the power of an acknowledgement or a statement ends with the last sentence, it becomes hollow, just words. I encourage you to treat this acknowledgement as a starting point for your work, return to it, add new parts and adjust it to make it stronger, and then turn it into action. And then, I'd like to introduce Mary Ulrich. She will be our moderator for this event. Uh, Mary Ulrich is a homegrown Orange County resident. She is in uh, her 10th year as Ag Agriculture Program Leader for Cornell Cooperative Extension in Orange County. Um, before that, for 17 years, she was the vegetable crops educator, and before that, she was an integrated pest management coordinator. That's a long time ago. <laughs> she obtained when I was eight. <laughs> <laughs> she obtained her bachelor's of science in general ag from Cornell University, and she received her MBA from SUNY New Paltz in 2005. In her current efforts, she helps farmers produce and market their products, including including managing a myriad of regulations and programs that oversee the production and processing of food, making her an excellent choice for tonight's event. Thank you. So thank you, Styles. So excellent. I, when Styles and Sarah approached me, Styles in the office and then Sarah via phone call or Zoom, I think it was a Zoom, about helping with this, they said, oh, the Food System Coalition, we want to have a farm bill and we want you involved. And I was like, okay, because the farm bill's a lot. But, and as we got talking about what they wanted this session to be, I was like, oh, stop. I know two people that know way more than me, and they're really going to add to this program. So I'm going to moderate because they know way, way more than me. And just to sort of talk about how we're going to get to this, we're gonna talk about the farm bill, the what. Liz is gonna talk about history and what the farm bill is in a very general, over the top kind of. And then Chris is going to add how. How you impact, how you talk to legislators, who you talk to, how, the, how it works kind of to get change in the farm bill. So that's what we've been talking about these last couple of weeks is that that's what's gonna be presented tonight so that you know what you're in for. I'm not going to introduce it because our, our bios, the official bios are in the back of your handout. So I will say I'll introduce them separately as they come up, but Liz is first. I've worked with Liz for many years. She has serious experience in a wide range of extension and USDA and other government jobs that relate to agriculture and conservation. Uh, she has worked on the language for farm bills in the past with legislators and other offices. She's absolutely been involved with this at that level many times. And I've known her because she worked at Cornell Cooperative Extension Ulster County as what would be my counterpart. And now we work on the same team, Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Team. She's the business management educator. I am just do a little piece of business management and some production stuff sometimes too. Um, so, Take it away, Liz. Thank you. Yeah, this is definitely, um, you know, I think I'm mm -hmm. sort of echo what Sarah said. The farm bill's a lot, you know, and so there's, and I was involved with the 1995 farm bill 
and the 2001 when I lived in DC, um, and I worked, um, I was a Farm Bill policy analyst. Um, but, you know, so I have not been involved with the Farm Bill, like the last couple of them in, in any like great detail. Um, but, you know, but it's a lot. And so I'm gonna try to talk about um, things to consider and sort of what you should sort of be aware as far as the federal process. Um, and then you're gonna have, I think, a very entertaining conversation um, with Chris who can really give, you know, we've talked a lot about this and who can really give you so much insight in how to be a, a, like a local advocate who's actually effective because um, Chris is very effective. So let me figure, see if I can figure out how to, it doesn't say page down, I'm like, ah, so old. Okay, so what is the farm bill, right? We keep talking about this being the farm bill, like it's a thing. And it's really just a legislative package, you know, it's traditionally, like I always say every five years, it's never any, every five years, right? It's like five years-ish on, you know, like on some sort of magical scale. I was working on what was supposed to be the 1995 farm bill and it was authorized in 19, 1996. So I actually was on a grant and I got a six month extension. Um, and yeah, so, so like the one thing you can count on life is death taxes and the farm bill will be two years late. Um, you know, it's focused on um, agriculture, rural development, nutrition, and conservation. And there have been, you know, 18 farm bills um, since 1990, 1933, most recently 2018. Um, I think this is right. And they talk about like titles in the farm bill. And one thing is, is that they change every farm bill. Like there is no, like there is no the farm bill and it's like a single thing. Part of the whole farm bill process is there are some core, legis there's some core legislation that is the core sort of farm bill program. Those 1938 and all 1949 programs that are sort of the, 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 the permanent legislation. I'll talk about that in a second. But then every year there's other, you know, there's other, um, programs, other legislation that's related to that, or new programs that get added to it. And um, so the, on the left-hand side, those are the titles that they had in the 2018 Farm Bill, Commodities, Conservation, Trade, Nutrition, Credit, Rural Development, Research, Forestry, Energy, and Horticulture. There are 10 titles. And then everything like that would go under that, right? Like, so you've got your conservation programs go under conservation your nutrition programs under nutrition. Um, they kind of line up with the, um, more or less, I think, with the House and Senate um, sort of subcommittees a little bit. But, um, but, this, but just for fun, I put the 1977 Farm Bill titles there. So you could see that they really are not set in stone. They're not like God-given or anything. And the titles for 1977 were Payment Limitations for Wheat, Feed Grains, Upland Cotton and Rice, Dairy and Beekeeper Programs, <laughs> Uh, wool and mohair, title four was wheat, title five is feed grains, title six is upland cotton, not downland cotton. Uh, we got title seven is rice, title eight is peanuts, title nine is soybeans and sugar, better together, right? Uh, we got title X is miscellaneous, <laughs> Lord only knows what's in that one. Uh, we got title nine is grain reserves, title uh, 12, 11 is grain reserves, Public Law 480, which is, I think, you remember what Public Law 480 is? I think it's like feeding programs. I think it's like, like food aid to like foreign people or something. But I'm not 100% sure. So if you know, like you can, you can tell other people later on. Uh, food Stamps Commodity Distribution Program, National Ag Research Extension Teaching Policy Act of 1977. That was like the biggest section. That was like their whole new thing that year. Um, rural Development Conservation, Federal Grain Inspection, this is going to the Wheat and Wheat Foods Research and Nutrition Act, and the Department of Agriculture Advisory Committees. So you can see, I mean, you know, these titles change. You can sort of see how they change given shifting emphasis, emphasi, I guess, if that's the plural, emphasis. Um, and, you know, like the old one was really focused on the commodity programs, and now we have a much broader sort of sense of things that are, that are in the farm bill. Um, you know, so, the, you know, there's sort of a process with like creating legislation. Um, you know, so the first thing is, is, you know, you have a new idea, you know, you want to fix a problem, protect the status quo. Like sometimes you get involved in federal policy, not because you want to change anything, but because you don't want it to change, right? Like you got a program and you better save that thing. Um, you know, and, and you want to secure your sources of funding. So there's a lot of reasons, you know, why you might be engaged in a farm bill 
process or, or farm legislation. But the first thing you need to ask yourself always is, is it necessary to change the law to make the change? You know, and I, I know this is a farm bill session and, and you know, people get really focused on, on legislation in the farm bill, especially when they first started getting involved in ag and ag programs. But honestly, you know, there's a lot of ways to skin that cat. Um, and, you know, actually I think my next, you know, so not every problem is a farm bill problem. Sometimes the problem is, is that there is, there is a law to do it. There's even appropriations to do it, but the people who are administering it, like they don't feel like doing it or they, they have other priorities, right? So, you know, like, you know, not every, that's, you know, like if you're thinking, if you're looking at ag policy, you know, the farm bill isn't like the only thing to be concerned about. A lot of ways to skin the cat. There's like the farm bill, there's laws. And the, and the farm bill is a whole like mishmash of a bunch of laws. There's appropriations. Um, and the farm bill, if you want to get money, uh, getting money for program um, regulations, you know, and that's the regulatory process, you know, responding to rules and things is really important because that's where um, you really actually, you can have like all these laws on the books, but if there's no regs, they don't happen. Um, I worked on the, the final rule of the, or the, of the National Organic Program. The law was in the farm, it was passed in 1990 the program didn't start until I think 2001 or two because it took 10 years to get regulations, you know, and the regulations are what actually like allowed the program to happen and that was, you know, and, and how the program, and a lot of times the, the laws are, are much more general than the regs, like the regs are how it happens and how the agencies are going to do it and how, what processes they're going to follow. The law just sort of says it, here's what it'll be and here's how much money we're going to give you. You know, that's, you know, so in some cases, some cases the law is more detailed. Agency policies, regulations, and guidelines. I mean, sometimes you have all of this stuff and the agency has just decided that this is the way they're going to do it. And so you, you just, you know, you can, you can have a, you know, process that way. And sometimes it's just staff focus and prioritization. They have all these programs. They only have so many hours in the day. And these are the ones they're focusing on. But it doesn't mean they can't do this other thing if they had you know, a champion or, or somebody pushing. So I just want to sort of take a step back even from Farm Bill and say, you know, when you're thinking about things that you want, you know, consider all of the facets of the issue and the problem. Don't just only ever horn in on the Farm Bill like every five years, because there's a lot of ways to, to, to make, to be very impactful. Um, so then you need, you know, if you're going to work on the Farm Bill, the, the next thing you need to do, and, and this is something that was newer to me when I first started working on federal policy, was what sections of the U.S. Code need to be changed or maintained, right? Like the Farm Bill, you know, the, is, is this bill, but where do they get the language for the bill, right? Like where does that come from? That language comes out of the U.S. Code, um, and so every time a law is passed, you have your public law and it gets passed, then some poor person at a desk somewhere in DC has to take that law and figure out like how it fits in to the overall, the code is just sort of the, the, the compilation of all of the laws so that they, you know, because sometimes they're changing other laws and sometimes they're adding new sections to laws and sometimes they're having new programs. And they, um, you know, and it's really, you know, it's in, for the Farm Bill um, and the US, you know, the USDA, you're concerned in the U.S. Code with sec Title VII, which is agriculture, and it's everything to do with agriculture is probably under Title VII, or Title XVI, which is conservation and forestry. So all like the, a lot of the NRCS programs and things like that, conservation reserve, will be under Title XVI. So if you want to see sort of what the current status is of the, you know, rather than trying to like, because a lot of times if you just look at the, the law, it says, it'll say things like, change this to this, or we replace this with this, and you're like, but what was there, and how does it read? And, and that's where you see sort of the, the big picture and, and how it reads. And, and often, um, you know, so that's, I, I think that's really, at least it was helpful to me when I first started, because I was trying to, like, find, like, the, you know, the, this law, and then I would find the law that, like, it was replacing, and, like, try to, like, and then find the law that it was replacing there. And you just go to the U.S. Code, and, and eventually it should all be there, and, um, and it'll tell you, like, what replaced what and, and, and what the history is. It's very interesting, actually. Um, and, and, and the code is like the mothership. I, I forgot that I put this thing up there. It's like the mothership of all the little, like, all the little laws and stuff that get passed. They all get, like, 
brought up into the, the mothership of the, of the US to the code. And then there's the, so there's the US code, like the laws, and then there's the code of federal regulations, and that's where all the regulations go. And so you have these, these two things, and that's where most of your, your farm policy will be found. Um, so then what you do is you start with that, and, and, and the, or, or people that are working with you will start with that, and you draft um, new language of the code that implements the idea or that you have, right? Like, and um, that's a bill. You know, and that's basically, that's where you get the language for a bill. And one way, you know, and that's, it's, it's sort of important to know that because, you know, you can't, like, if you don't have a place to hang your idea, it's very difficult to get it into, into policy. So that's how bills are come out of is you'll say, okay, you know, we want to do this, and then they'll go through the code and they'll see, like, okay, well, where, where does that fall, like, generally? And then, um, you know, and they'll say, okay, well, like, what do we need to change here or maintain? What do we need to keep? You know, make sure nobody changes that. Um, what do we need to protect? And, um, and then you, you know, your final bill is passed by the House and Senate, signed as a law, and then it becomes a law, and then it gets shoved up, you know, like yeah. this, you know, it becomes a law, which yeah. if this, just watch, I don't even know why you're here, just watch this. <laughs> um, you know, is there anybody here that doesn't know Schoolhouse Rock? If not, like, yeah, just go. I almost just put this up and said, I'll just eat chips or Ted something. Kennedy's yeah. office used to play that in the outer office. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, I used to watch. Yeah, it's. I'd walk in his office and he'd have it playing in his office. It really is good. I mean, it's actually really, really surprisingly accurate and entertaining. Um, yeah, and then the new laws are incorporated back eventually into the U.S. Code. And so that's sort of the, the cycle of how, you know, sort of this, this process of you know, getting language into, you know, into the code. You know, so this is the part that you guys are gonna be working on with the Farm Bill, right? This creating a draft of new language that implements the idea or protects your turf or, or whatever. Um, and these are your key players. You got your House of Representatives and you've got your, the US Senate. Um, and the House Committee on Ag um, has right now, I think 51 members and five subcommittees. And these are the subcommittees. I don't know why it's doing this, but it's com General Farm Commodities Risk Management. There's 15 members, Commodity Exchanges, Energy and Credit, Conservation and Forestry, Nutrition Oversight and Departmental Operations, Biotechnology, Horticulture Research, and Livestock and Foreign Agriculture. So one thing you do, like one way to sort of um, figure uh, is, you know, is figure out like who, these are the, when, when a piece of legislation, uh, like with the Farm Bill, the people who are where you saw there's all those titles and, and there's this big code and there's like just a lot of stuff. There isn't one person trying to figure everything out, right? Because they would go nuts. Um, people specialize, you know, and their staff specializes. And, um, and so they, you know, there will be, there is no one, ultimately there's one farm bill, but the process of getting there, there's multiple bills. There's multiple, people are putting bills in all the time or they're making amendments to bills or they're putting in all new bills and, you know, and then they're combining their bills into like a bigger bill. And, and, and so things will tend to have start in the subcommittee. Like somebody will, somebody will have an idea and it may come from outside the subcommittee, but then it'll be given to that subcommittee to chew on. Um, and then that will go like out of the subcommittee to the full ag committee. And then somebody may like submit some more little changes or new bills or whatever. And then it'll go back to the subcommittee and they'll chew on it for a while. But the people that are like doing a lot, like it has to, if, if something doesn't get like a piece of the thing doesn't get out of that subcommittee, that can be really challenging for progressing sort of a, an idea or whatever out like further up into the ag committee and then ultimately to the House and then ultimately to the Senate. And the House and Senate, and so here's the Senate. They've got 22 members on the, the Senate Committee on Ag and five subcommittees. And they also, they're, they're fairly, they don't, they're a little more, you know, they're not exactly the same as the House. They don't line up exactly, but they're pretty similar. Um, you know, they've got one on conservation, climate and forestry, food, nutrition, specialty crops, organics and research, livestock, dairy, poultry, um, commodities, risk management. And you know the ideal, you know the ideal scenario is you have you know somebody on one of these, you know both on the house, the, the committee, but also on a subcommittee that's interested that you have a relationship that's interested in what you're interested in, because the subcommittee people, like, are the people that will be working on the specific areas often that that you're working on. 
Um, so then they all, like, once again, they're, they're, they're making lots of bills, and they're throwing in, people are throwing in new ideas, and they're throwing out, and, and this goes on for a long, that's just why it takes five years, right? Like, it's a, and, and what happens is, you know, you've got, like, you have a Congress, like, Congress, the House pretty much turns over every two years, you know, they, is turning over pretty regularly, you know, so you've got um, a, you know, you've only got a year, really, to get, uh, um, you know, like something to, to progress to the point that it, it can be voted on, because if it, it, if it doesn't, by the time that that, you know, that Congress is, is done, then they're back to the drawing board and they have to start all over again. When, you know, the, the bill will have a new, it'll be instead of HR 117-23, it'll be HR 118-4 or whatever. Like, you have to, it, it doesn't mean that they, like, completely start over because they've got on word perfect or whatever their, their text, but it means the process has to start up again. It, it, it'll be, have a new bill number. It'll have like a new, because it's a new Congress, a new, a new, you know, it'll have a different number. Um, but it may be fundamentally the same language as the last Congress had. You know, it, it kind of depends. Um, so the Farm Bill is what they call an omnibus bill. And that's a bill that has like lots of different pieces of legislation, what could be like just separate legislation, all rolled into one big kahuna, um, you know, at once. And this, you know, this is partly done because having a really broad constituency of farmers, nutrition people, conservation people, rural development people, like they all have a stake in this thing. And, and so it makes it more likely that, you know, people, you know, Congress, you can get it to the full committee and then you can get it to the full House and the full Senate because a lot of people care rather than just, you know, if it was really narrow, if it was just like rural electrification, if you're not rural and you don't have a power problem, you probably aren't, like, you know, it's going to be harder to get attention for that kind of a, a piece of legislation. So every year, I mean, and this is something like every year Congress proposes over 5,000 bills and only 7% actually become a law, you know. Um, so it's, you know, so otherwise it's, you know, it's, you, you want all the, the help you can get, you know, all the, the, the other, you know, advocacy people you can get. And then the House and Senate Ag Committees, you know, you, they can propose bills that affect, you know, the Section 7 or 16 of the code any time. It doesn't mean, you, it's not like you can only make a law that affects agriculture, like, during the farm bill. Because there's, there's a lot of laws that actually, you know, that get passed that are not in the farm bill. It's just, um, their odds, you know, because you have this process, and because members of Congress have other things to do, too, they would, you know, they, there's an incentive also to be somewhat streamlined. Um, but I've seen them pull things out, and, and, you know, especially if they're not one of the core pieces of legislation and run with it by itself, if they think it's got some legs and it's going to get mired in a two- or three-year farm bill process. Um, so why do we need, you know, why do we even need laws for programs, honestly? Like, they just sort of take a step back to get money, right? Like, that's why we need laws, um, because authorization laws, like having an author, a legal authorization for a program is often a prerequisite for Congress to appropriate money to that program. So the Farm Bill is, is fundamentally just a big vehicle for money for ag, right? Like, that's really, in a nutshell, what it is, largely. And then it's also to determine how USDA and federal resources are allocated. Um, you know, so that the law, you know, it does sort of say like, okay, we're going to have this and we're going to uh, allocate this much money for it. We're going to have this and we're going to allocate this much money. There will be, there will be a mohair program this year, you know, beekeepers, they're going to have a program again. You know, so it does also the law, otherwise it's up to the agency to do what it wants to do. And so the law, like the law is a way of like making the agencies divvy up their resources that they get in ways that the public can vote on you know, like indirectly through their members and, and actually have some influence in, in allocating. Um, why do we have it every five years? Uh, there was always the zombie, like, permanent farm legislation. That was always, like, especially when I was working on that, you know, there was the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938 and the Agricultural Act of 1949. And these were, like, the permanent laws that sort of were the, the base of a lot of, especially the commodity programs and the, the traditional farm programs. And if the, you know, and there was language in a lot of those that if the farm bill wasn't reauthorized, like if it wasn't reauthorized, that it reverted back to the, you know, that 
it reverted back to these, these, uh, these what they call um, permanent pieces of legislation. And um, the ag, you know, and those had um, some commodity programs that were very, you know, sort of designed during um, the Depression. Um, the, the 1949 Act had some very generous dairy policies. Uh, if I were a dairy farmer, actually reverting back to the 49 Act would be, would be A-OK -okay with me. Um, I think it's like $8 a gallon milk is an estimate of seen if we had that, that program going right now. Um, but that was always the, it was, that was like, if we, if we don't get a farm bill out, you know, it's going to go back and we're going to have, we're going to be living under, like, we're going to be living like it's 1949. Um, that never happens, right? Like, that was the, that was like the specter. But, but they can also extend the, the prior legislate, you know, the prior authorization. So it's not, it was, it was, it was always a threat, but it was, it was more like a spur, right? Like, it was more, I think, Largely, though, the, that language is in the, there um, was largely to just sort of be like, you know, it kind of like lit a fire under people's butts a little bit. You know, it got it got more attention, but it wasn't it wasn't really going to happen because there's other ways besides you know completely changing the farm bill to, to do that. But also money, like a lot of times these programs, you know, they the every five years, you know, they'll write the they'll write it so that you've got five years of appropriations. For that program, and then at the end of five years or six years or whatever, they you know they either have to extend that you know the, that or it goes for a year with no funding, which has happened, and um, you know and so you you need to reauthorize the, the farm bill so that you can also reauthorize funding for programs that you, you care about and the the authority to not just the amount of funding but the authority to give funding to those programs. And uh, also, I just want to also, because this is a, a food systems thing, we talk a lot about the farm bill and the five-year farm bill process. A lot of the programs that we care about are not in the farm bill. They're in the Child Nutrition Act, which is also a five-year cycle traditionally, although I think it hasn't been done for a few years, a while. It doesn't have to be done every five years, but it was also one of those sort of omnibus, like big programs. But that's where your school lunch program, your school breakfast program, your farm to school programs, your farmer's market nutrition programs, those are all found in this. So you're not going to see those in the farm bill because they're, they're actually under a totally different piece of legislation. They're, they're authorized under that law. But, but some of the commodity programs and some of the other things allocate funding to, say, buy commodities that then are bought by the schools through the National School Lunch Program. Mm -hmm. So the farm bill may impact funding or the access to food for some of those things because it's allowing, it's setting aside money or has other programs that match up with these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll, there's a lot of that in ag. Like you'll see that like in a, in a lot of these le pieces of legislation where they'll reference other, like this, this makes this change in this program or to, to be consistent with this program or yeah, so it's, you know, it's definitely, you know, so you can't, you know, that's the other complexity is, you know, you're looking at one piece of legislation, but often it's affected by, you know, multi, or, well, I guess, or, you know, or one system which is affected by multiple pieces of legislation and policy. Um, and and the, this, this is a, a really good program, example of that kind of program that you would think would be in the farm bill, but it's not in the farm bill. So, but it's, but it's affected by the farm bill. And so, yeah. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Well, I'm going to introduce Chris quickly. So, uh, well, a couple of things before we get, we'll go into this. But Chris, I've worked with Chris for many years now. He's a producer on the muck, has his own farm, went away to school. Basically, I think your story was that you uh, were dreaming about mowing the lawn you were watching the guy mow the lawn outside of the office building you were working in. Yeah, wish I was outside. Um, and so his, his education is primarily in communications. Now, he's really a James Bond expert, but yep. the communications part of being able to talk to people and come to meetings, and it, it made him sort of a zebra in the agricultural community because he was willing and able to speak, write, listen in a way that a lot of other farmers have not had formal training and are not comfortable doing. 
So it quickly became a regional mouthpiece for sure. And some of that has reflected back on me because, though I will tell you, those of us in extension, we cannot lobby. We are straight up 501c3, cannot lobby. However, Except for extension funding. <laughs> <laughs> well, even then, I think we've No, we, like, if it's, if it's we're okay. funding our own programs, we can lobby all day long. Some of us do have the little, you know, have filled out the little form that you've got to fill out that mm -hmm. your official lobbyist, some of our staff and faculty mm -hmm. have done that. But, since we, but we can educate. So, my story is, and her story is, I don't call up the legislator to tell them blah, blah, blah. Chris tells them blah, 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 and then Chris says, if you need backup, call Mary. Yep. And so when the legislator calls me, I can tell them what's going on or what the fact is. Just last week, Schumer's office asked me if there was a laundry list of things I would go over about the Farm Bill. What are the top 10, whatever, can we have a meeting? Sure, I'll answer your questions based on what I know because they want specifically for the Hudson Valley. Um, Congressman Maloney certainly did that last farm bill. I was getting phone calls while they were negotiating the farm bill. How will this impact Hudson Valley farmers? Um, so I can answer those questions because of course the majority of the folks often on those committees are from, I don't know, Newark is a big ag state but the bigger ag states, with, uh, the big five, which are strong, cotton, corn, soybeans, wheat, and rice. The states that have those commodities wield a lot of influence because those lobbying agencies and groups wield a lot of influence. So again, we don't lobby, but, so Chris does the lobbying, I do the educating, and the one thing Chris is gonna, I think it's his pet peeve, I know it is, and I, there's two things to know in the, in, the, in the how, how you're going to influence. The first one is who you're gonna yell at. So make sure you're yelling at the right legislator. Do not yell at federal legislators about state problems or vice versa. It's a waste of um, time. It's a, now, there are, there are rare instances where that can work. Your state legislator that you're educating, lobbying to, has a great relationship with, maybe it's the same party, maybe not, but probably the same party, the federal person that may have an impact. You're asking them to intercede on your behalf. That might work, but you can't give them a hard time because it's not their, it's not their party. So, or it's not their, I shouldn't say party, I mean that party in terms of activity, not party in terms of Republican or Democrat. And the other thing is, you cannot just, and I know you're gonna go into this, you cannot just complain. You must tell them how to fix what you want. And like Chris does, he actually writes the legislation, so it's like, I don't like this, you should introduce this. And they take it, and then a lot of times they run with it, and sometimes it becomes something. You can't just say, this is impacting me negatively. You have to follow up with, so I need you to vote yes on H1, you know, one, two, three, four, or S, you know, four, five, six, seven, uh, or no, or I want you to add that to this bill, or this is how this bill could be better for me, is if you added this while it's still in committee. So that's why the original list just tells you about the whole, all the parts, because if you're going to make a change, you have to, you have to educate the staff about how to get that there. Because just complaining gets nowhere fast. Okay, now on to Chris. Thank you, Mary. So I appreciate the invitation very much. Uh, a little bit about my background. I have, um, I grew up in the farm. I started working on the farm when I was four years old, uh, doing physical labor, and, um, but I did well in school. So I uh, went on and I eventually, like Mary mentioned, I have a bachelor's and master's degrees in uh, communication studies, primarily in broadcasting and film studies. And like she said, my area of expertise is James Bond. If I had gotten my PhD, which I was on track to at Iowa, University of Iowa, it would have been on James Bond, believe it or not. So it's a bit of a, a diversion. But when I came back uh, to work on the farm back in the early 90s, uh, we were hit by hail in 1996 by a significant hailstorm. And most of the onions in the area were wiped out. And we 
got to find out very quickly how bad the federal crop insurance program was. And I was one of the few people, as she said, that really knew how to articulate an argument. And part of it is, to, as far as affecting change and to, um, to effectively lobby or to uh, get a policy, whatever, it's a two-pronged assault or s strategy. One is dealing with the legislators and their staffs and the like, and the other is dealing with the media. And you need, really need to, um, if you have especially have a, an overarching large uh, issue, building support of the media uh, is really important. And that is a key way in which that, I say we, my wife and I, got a lot of things accomplished over the years. We were willing to, one of the few farmers who were to talk to the media and to actually uh, personalize the situation going through. Saying, you know, this area is wiped out by hail is one thing, but then going on camera and saying, I have $200,000 that was in that crop that's lost, I have bills I can't pay, and my wife almost in tears on CNN, that's a whole other matter. And it carries a significant amount of weight um, with those legislators and the staff. Um, as far as, so I started working on pol public policy stuff in the mid-96 or so. So I've been doing it close to 30 years uh, on the local, state, and federal level, working on issues on the local level, of changing the speed limit in front of my road, up to the federal level, um, trying to make changes in the federal crop insurance program and working on disaster aid programs. Uh, my experience with the Farm Bill, in, in the 2002 Farm Bill, my wife and I got a $10 million earmark that was only for the onion farmers of Orange County, New York, that was put in in, the, uh, in that 2002 Farm Bill. Uh, it was something that uh, Congressman Ben Gilman at the time accomplished and did a lot of horse training to do. Um, it took us about five years to get that done. Um, and uh, again, it was a significant amount of letters, phone calls, uh, trips down to Capitol Hill and the like, and there's some stories I'll, I'll tell about that in a second. Uh, in the 2008 uh, Farm Bill, um, we almost got in a, we had a conservation program called the Conservation on Muck Soils Program, or the COMS Program. And it was born out of a uh, conservation program that was in the, in the muck soil, it's the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, where the NRCS agent in Orange County went rogue and basically put, um, by, I think it was something like um, over a thousand acres of muck land in this program that was never intended to be in it. Uh, the program was supposed to be for, the, the slogan for CREP was farm, uh, uh, farm the best, CREP the rest. It was for crappy ground near waterways. And this guy enrolled a significant amount of incredible ground that had nowhere near any kind of significant waterways. And because of that, it led to significant problems, uh, including our land rent rates went up uh, exponentially because we were now competing with the federal government for the amount of payments that were being paid for the CREP program and the cost of land went up in incredibly because of the fact that so much land was taken out of production because it was a land retirement program, the CREP program for 10 or 15 years. So we created the comms program to kind of mitigate the damage and our t congressman at the time was John Hall and John, there was that farm bill that was um, on the house side, there was 10 amendments that were allowed to be voted on on a voice vote. And that was one of the 10 that was allowed to be voted on. And it passed on a voice vote in the house side. Um, part of the, again, the horse training goes on. You know, John Hall, John Hall was a great congressman, a great guy too. He was a member of the rock band, the Orleans from 1970s. You know, still the one, Dance With Me, um, uh, Love Takes Time. He wrote all those songs or co-wrote them with his, with his wife. Uh, he, the, the chair of the ad committee at the time was Colin Peterson from Minnesota, who had a band. And John like, agreed to be in his band in order to get this vote for this, uh, for this amendment. And it, it, I, got, I got a million stories like that. And that's one of them. That's how that got to be voted on. It did not make it. It was a small program, relatively speaking. It was $50 million over the five-year period. So it was a quarter of a billion dollars, which is nothing in terms of uh, appropriations. Um, but it was killed when it went to conference basically by the Senate side, by um, Tom Harkin's people. Because Harkin's people viewed it as being a threat to his CSP. So, and we didn't have at the time, we didn't have a dog in the fight, as it were, on the authorizer committees. When I first started doing this, um, at the time, we had no members, the authorizer committee being the House or Senate Agriculture Committees versus the Appropriation Committees. At the time, we only had, we had no members in the, in the New York delegation on the authorizer committees. We had two members on the House Ag Appropriations Subcommittee, Maurice Hinchy and James Walsh from uh, Syracuse area in central New York. Not having a member on the authorizing committee was a huge, huge handicap. Um, having a member on the committees makes a big difference in getting things accomplished. Today now we have, on the Senate side, we have uh, obviously Senator Gillibrand, 
who is an effective uh, member of that in, in behalf of our uh, in behalf of agriculture, and especially agriculture pertaining to New York. And on the House side, we've had in the past we had Congressman uh, Maloney. Uh, currently, the Republicans have announced their members, and uh, there's two members: um, a Congressman New York 23 Langworthy or something. His name is I don't know him. And then Marcus Molinero, who's local, is going to be on it. My understanding is I would. Uh, Pat Ryan told me he is he is asking to be on it, so hopefully that he will get appointed to it and we'll have a dem on it. Obviously, if you can get both parties on it, it helps out a great deal. Um, as both Liz and Mary mentioned, agriculture quite often is not partisan. It's more uh, the issue is divided up as far as uh, commodity and region. Mm -hmm. uh, back in uh, 2000, I was interviewed by the Senate Democrat Policy Committee, the Technology Division. I was video interviewed in the atrium of the Hart Building, which is one of the Senate office buildings. And they, did a, they were doing issues related to the Farm Bill, the upcoming Farm Bill at the time of 2002. And one of the, the questions they asked me, I thought they were going to ask me questions along the lines of, you know, how, how are farmers, you know, how do the Republicans screw you? How they, and, and it was not that way at all. The questions they asked me were, how are you screwed or shortchanged being a specialty crop farmer in the Northeast versus being one of the commodity farmers um, in, the, in the Midwest? So um, that was, the comms was the 08. And I also, I testified in 2010 for that, that, farm, for that farm, uh, farm bill. I was in the, testified in the Senate in the first hearing that was held for the reauthorization of that farm bill. So that hearing had, um, uh, the first person testified was uh, Secretary Vilsack. Then it was the head of the two farming organizations, Farm Bureau and National Farmers Union. And then there were four farmers that were picked to testify. And I was Senator Gillibrands. I was one of the four that testified. And I testified on the federal crop insurance program, which is one of the areas of expertise I have and I've worked on extensively and the shortcomings of it. I have a blog, muckville.com, M-U-C-K-V-I-L-L-E, muckville.com. Well, it's my humor outlet and stuff, but if, I haven't blogged a lot recently, but if you go on it in the search box, you type in testimony, you could actually read my online, and you actually see also the testimony part, both, um, both the uh, prepared part where you, you've given five minutes to read your, your, um, your testimony, and then the part where, the, um, where the, uh, it was basically the ranking member, Saxby Chambliss and the chair, Blanche Lincoln, asked us, the four of us, questions on it, and you can see. Where I got to work in a Bugs Bunny quote, which my old professor was very pleased with that I got to work that in for it, which was very, which was a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, also in this farm bill coming up, I have a I have a proposal. It's my oldest one. I've been working on about ten years now. It's called Farm to Food Bank. If you're familiar with the Nourish program in New York, basically Farm to Food Bank is a Nourish program, but on the federal level. I I've been pushing pushing the idea of it. Um, in the proposal for about over 10 years. And my understanding is it's got a very good chance of getting into this farm bill. And what it came out of was back, it was born out of when the Tea Party uh, had come into power um, or had real a lot of influence, in, in, in the, especially on the House side. Um, they were talking at the time, they wanted to separate the titles. Um, they wanted to get the nutrition title out of the farm bill and separate it from the agricultural title, which would be disastrous. If you know the history of it, it came about in the 1970s where it was wed together by Bob Dole and, um, and uh, George McGovern. And it was a brilliant, brilliant piece of strategy. Um, they knew that they wed the, those, put those titles together. The urban legislators would always vote for not just the farm bill, but the annual ag appropriation bills each year, which is the, frame, the farm bill is a framework for each time. They would get the votes for the annual ag appropriations bills and the farm bill, while the um, rural legislators would vote for it because of the uh, agricultural programs. And, the, and the, the Tea Party people wanted to separate the titles, which was insane. But one of the arguments they used was the nutrition stuff has nothing to do with farming, which is dumb because obviously where did this food come from? It doesn't come from a replicator from Star Trek. It comes from growing it. And there are some, there are some uh, aspects of it, like the uh, Farmer's Market Nutrition Program and the like, that are in there. But the, one of the arguments I used for my, and the uh, reasons for my proposal was the fact that it would be go in the, it would go in the agricultural title, not the nutrition title, and would wed the titles together. So it was a win-win in the sense of it was a win for farmers because it opened up a market that wasn't there before, which would be the food insecure. It was a win for the food insecure because they're getting fresh produce, and it was a win for policy because it would wed the titles together. So hopefully that'll be in. Um, as mentioned too, like Elizabeth talked about, it's not just obviously it's a farm bill. I work on other um, 
uh, proposals all the time. Unlike, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Night Shift where um, Michael Keaton has to talk about Billy Blaze and he's like, shh, things are constantly hitting him. That's the same with me. Um, one of the proposals I had just recently I got in, which was a pretty big one, was if you heard about the, it was the uh, uh, forgiveness of debt for small farmers. That was my proposal. I pitched that in 2019 um, when I went in, on the Hill back in November of 2019. Uh, Senator Gillibrand's staff in particular, Senator Gillibrand ran with it. It was her primary push for it. It went through a lot of <laughs> changes and stuff like that. That's uh, kind of interesting, but eventually it got put into the Inflation Reduction, Reduction Act. And like Elizabeth talked about, you know, it's one thing to get something, even a piece of legislation with legislative language, but then again, what the, um, what the, eight, what the uh, executive branch does is a whole other matter. Right now we're waiting on what the USDA is gonna do um, with that, and so far I'm, I'm not very pleased with what I'm hearing. Um, it's not with a... Right, so let's break this down a bit because Liz mentioned it, you mentioned it, I'm gonna use my, you know, my moderator powers here. Um, because Inflation Reduction Act, the infrastructure bill, even uh, several of the appropriations during COVID all had, none of it was in the farm bill, mm -hmm. but has impacted agriculture and has provided money directly to farmers or for farmer infrastructure like meat processing plants and stuff like that. So why don't you break down a little bit how, why particularly this money, even though it was passed, is not in your is not in anybody's pocket yet because there's all these other steps that yeah, actually right. USDA, made it to the Supreme Court. Right, and, you, and yeah, and USDA has to come up with the rules and stuff. When when I originally proposed that, it was again it was a debt. For, it was on an economic level, and one of the arguments I made was the fact that um, constantly most of the assistance that's done on the federal level um, benefits uh, primarily larger producers. When Trump did. Um, it took money from the CCC, the Commodity Credit Corporation, to make up for the damage he did with some of his trade moves. Um, the bulk of that money went to very large operators, something like 96% went to the top 4% of operators or something along those lines. A lot of it. Um, which is very funny because when, we, when my wife and I were fighting for disaster aid for our crop losses back in the 90s, one of the things in the early 2000s, one of the things we proposed was taking money from the Commodity Credit Corporation and using that. And we were told by numerous offices on the Hill, like, you can't touch that, you can't do that. And guess what? Trump did it. <laughs> you can do it. And we were like, there's, there's actually nothing legally that prevented him from doing it. But, um, but until those rules are, are, are established and set, um, it's up in the air. So now what I've been doing is I've been obviously working my, the congressional offices to make sure that what's conveyed to the, the executive branch is this is what the congressional intent was um, and what it should be. Um, another example of that, in the previous farm bill, there was a provision in it called, it's a very small provision called the Equitable Relief Act. And what it basically says, I don't have the language in front of me, but basically what it says is, if the USDA screwed up in some manner and giving advice or direction or whatever to a farmer, then the secretary is directed to provide equitable relief to that farmer. Well. What happened to uh, uh, the farmers in, the, in our area in, in 96, we were hit by hail in July. And our crops were, the onions were cut up with hail. And there's no force on God's green earth that's gonna stop those onions from ba basically becoming rotten. There's, when those onions were cut open, water and, and soil went in, it led to bacterial decay, and there's no spray, there's no fungicide that's gonna stop, or bactericide that's gonna stop that from happening. So I kept, contacting USDA at that point, asking them, begging them, let us destroy the crop, because the, the, the proper practice would have been to destroy the crop at that point. And USDA refused. And in fact, um, we got direction from USDA that said, if we did destroy the crop, we would void our crop insurance. And so they forced us to take it to harvest. And then, kind of putting the knife in, the third week of September, the uh, head of the uh, risk management agency, which oversees the federal crop insurance program, Ken Ackerman, who was my uh, arch enemy at the time, the little fella he was. I used to make fun of him a lot. I um, to DC about this. Yeah, he, uh, he gave a manager's bulletin giving us permission to destroy the crop third week of September. And by that time, Elvis has left the building. I mean, we have already harvested the crop, let alone you know, not cared for it. So that situation fits perfectly what's described in the equity relief. We were forced by USDA to take the crop to harvest and, 
And because of that, we incurred huge debts which I had to take loans out to pay for. I had bills, I had, and they said they were gonna audit us and they wanted to see our chemical bills, our labor bills. So in other words, I couldn't just abandon the crop. US, or the Trump administration did not philosophically agree with the Equitable Relief Act. So there is no, basically there's no structural rules associated with it and they're doing nothing with it. So it's a, it's a, it's a directive that sits on the books as part of the Farm Bill that nothing is being done with. So what I've been trying to do is trying to work with now the new administration, especially before the next Farm Bill comes in and, and replaces it, to have that done so that we can possibly at least get that debt forgiven or returned to us because after we paid the loans back because that wasn't our fault at the time. Now some other, uh, I'm trying to come up with anecdotes of some of the things that Liz said. Um, the people that are responsible for writing this stuff are, are Ledge Council, Legislative Council. And a, a, a funny story that happened to us in, in, uh, with the 2002 farm when we got the $10 million earmark, we were told, uh, my wife was the one working with, we were working with, and my wife in particular was working with Speaker Hastert's office um, on, on the, uh, who would be the agency that would administer it and how much it was and so on and so forth. And at the last minute before it was, it was passed, we were told that, um, my wife was told it was gonna be cut from 10 million to 8 million. And you know, our losses were closer to 30 million or so, 30 to 50, but it's like, what are you gonna do? You, you, you're not gonna say no, it's like whatever. So the day the farm bill passed, I got a phone call from a woman named Jean Bordewick, who at the time was Chuck Schumer's Hudson Valley rep. And Jean calls me up and says, congratulations, you got your 10 million. And I go, it's 8 million, Jean. She says, no, it's 10 million. I said, no, it's 8 million. She says, I'm reading the language, it's 10 million. So I got on the phone with um, uh, Ben Gilman's uh, L legislative director, his LD, and I said, Todd, what, what happened? It's supposed to be 8 million. And he said, word never got from the speaker's office to ledge council to change the dollar amount. So because word never got to it, we got the 10 million instead of the 8 million. So that's the kind of uh, things that could happen. Now, in dealing with uh, working on the federal level offices, obviously the most important person to deal with is obviously the member, is the, uh, the elected rep, the senator, or the, or the house member. But you don't wanna deal with them very much because they don't, typically don't know very much of, of, of this issue. I mean, they have, to, they have to know a million things and you know, it's typically, unless they're a farmer themselves, they're not gonna be expert on agricultural policy or farming. So the people you wanna get to know is the staff. The next person, obviously, in, in importance in the office is the chief of staff. And then after that, the legislative director, the LD. If you can get, and then after that, the, the specific staffer who's assigned to, in their portfolio to work on the issue that you, in this case, agriculture, the agricultural staffer. You wanna find out in that office who the ag staffer is and, he, and possibly the LD. If you can connect with the legislative director who's responsible for all legislation that goes through that office, um, and in conjunction with the staffer, that's the people you want to know. Now, the frustrating thing is, um, obviously, these, they, they cycle through. And you, you'll get really close to a staff member, and you get to work with them for a couple of years, and all of a sudden, they're leaving. They, there is a lot, though, of institutional memory of sorts. So you want to establish as good a relationship as possible with them because they'll either go on to another office or they'll pass on to the next person um, that replaces them uh, about you and, and your issues and interests. When um, two staffers back, Senator Gillibrand's ag staffer was a guy named Eric Diebel. And Eric came and visited my farm a couple of years ago. And he said how when, when um, he had replaced a, a woman by the name of um, Catherine Tanner, who was an ag staffer. And Catherine brought him, when he was, was being hired, a stack of this big of my materials. <laughs> because I inundate, I sent, them, you know, I sent them a plethora of stuff and she brought like four folders about this tall. And she says, you know, you got to get to know Chris Plavelski and Eve. They you know, want to know anything on ag issues, especially in the muck soils, but in New York and especially crops, he's the person you want to talk to because they know, you know, everything. And if he doesn't know it, he'll hook you up with who does. You want to try and establish that kind of relationship with them. You want to build that. Because what it comes down to fundamentally, it's all about relationships and building them. Now, one thing uh, Mary said, which is also very true, is the fact that, again, you don't want to just complain. Uh, I serve on, and I'm sure some of you do as well, on uh, various like congressional ag advisory panels or, or state senate or like that. And I've served on them for years. And um, if you've ever been to any of them, 
quite often they're very frustrated. I don't say very much during them. Um, it's very frustrating. It's just usually a bitch session where people go around the room and complain and whine and cry, which to me is, is very frustrating. Uh, Senator Clinton, uh, when my wife served on her panel, took my wife aside one time and said to my wife, she really admired and respected Eve and I because we didn't just complain. We told them what we wanted. We gave them, and she said, most important to us, you told us what to do because we need to know what, what do you want us to do. And then she said, and your husband on top of it, and, your wife, and, you, and your, you and your husband, you write legislative language, you write talking points to defend it, you contact the media um, to get stories um, in the media. And that's what they, they need to do. Just whining and complaining doesn't accomplish anything. I'm going to say, all. actually, with getting stories in the media, the more you can also mention the congressman's name while you're on yes. the story in the well, media. Invite them. Yes. They like that. Yeah, yes. or invite them. I mean, nothing beats, nothing beats free press. Over the years, I've never donated to an elected official. I have never been asked by any of them to uh, vote for them. I've never done a fundraiser for any of them at all. Um, but what I have done is, which I'm very good at, is getting media coverage. And in, and in that, getting with that media coverage, usually having them there and crediting them, because nothing beats that, that free press that's not being paid for um, from the public. That makes a huge difference. What you also not want to do um, <laughs> is, on the, the other hand, yeah is, <laughs> yeah, is burn a bridge. And this, this is a true story. Um, when we were working on getting the, um, the earmark back in the uh, early aughts or the late 90s, uh, when Congressman Hinchy was a uh, congressman for the district, and this, this, this is this the district mm -hmm. right now. So he had secured some funding for, because at the same time, some, the apple growers have been hit by hail as well in the, regionally here. And he secured some funding for them. Not very much, it was a small amount, but he got some funding for them. And they went in the press and they badmouthed him. And so I was with a group, a contingent of New York Farm Bureau members who were, did a, we used to do a DC trip, lobby trip. And we were in his office and it was a large group of us. There was like maybe, I think maybe 15 or more there. And normally this meeting would be, like the, the LD at the time was Diane Miller, who now works for Cornell. She's mm -hmm. Cornell's lobbyist on Capitol Hill. But Diane was his LD at the time. But Congressman Hinchy was in there too. And he was pissed. I mean pissed. And he actually, he started dropping F-bombs and you guys here, you badmouth me and this and that. And he started, I mean, he was cursing blue. And then he started looking at the name tags of people and he saw that, because we had our counties on and stuff like that, and he could see that there was no one from basically, it was like one person that was there was actually from his district. So they kind of calmed down. So I, um, after the meeting was over, and I I'd, you know, I'd met him a few times and I worked with Diane a little bit because one of their things was crop insurance. I said, Congressman, I said, if you got half of what you got your farmers, my farmers in, in, in Orange County, there'd be holes in my knees in the back of your pants with me crawling on my, on my knees to kiss your ass and put a hole in. <laughs> and he laughed and stuff like that. But later, um, after we secured the uh, $10 million, the apple growers in the area asked us to give a presentation, my wife and I, on what we did. And the first thing I wrote on the blackboard was, rule number one, <laughs> do not, you know, bad mouth or whatever the member, unless you're prepared to burn that bridge. Rule number two is see rule number one. And like in my life, I mean, the only time that I've ever done it was when dealing with um, Nan Hayworth, who was absolutely, and I'll say this now, evil, um, so, and horrible to deal with. There is, for not-for-profits, there is a, a, a weak spot every year around election time. So there's the member, and then possibly who else is running for that spot if they're right. up. Right. So doing things that time of year, especially if you're a not-for-profit 501c3, doing things that time of year can get very tricky. So just avoid it. What? I, I wait mean, until it's over. Wait until somebody's in in January. If it's the new person, you want to teach them anyway. You can always, you can always, at least our rule, always invite the person that's currently in office. Unless, well, there's there's an exception. <laughs> we in. And we were wiped out by, if you remember back in 2011, we were wiped out by Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee. In, in the black area, we were just totally underwater. It was like the, the those flooded twice that, that period. There were um, pumpkins floating yeah. under the George Washington it, Bridge that originated from. But it affected Canada. up here as well. So we needed um, supplemental uh, disaster aid we needed. And um, 
at the time, uh, the House prodded on by the Tea Party people took the position of, and at the time the Majority Leader Eric Cantor was the one who uh, uh, spoke it, was there was not going to be any disaster aid unless there was offsets in the budget. And that's a big change. In the past, when there was ever disaster aid that was done, uh, what's that? Yeah, just, yeah, just yeah, there was never offsets required. That was a big change. And Nan Hayworth, who was like in her, in her first full year, in, I think, in, 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 the, in the seat, backed Eric Cantor's position. So I'm in a different position because I, and I do have an, an entity that's a, that I have that is um, nonpartisan, so I, I, do, I am careful. But we organized a, um, I helped organize a meeting where at the time Sean Patrick Maloney was running for the House seat. So we had him visit one of the local, one of the farms in the black dirt to see the damage. And my goal is I wanted to get him on the record that he would support the disaster aid. And my goal was also maybe motivate Nan Hayworth to change her position and the like. So all I did though is I facilitated him hooking up with the, um, the farmers that were, where the place was at. And somehow one of the people on the, and I invited a whole bunch of farmers to come. And I said in the email, email I says, you know, I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm, not telling you, I'm just telling you if you, to show up because if a bunch of people are here and they see this, they'll see it's an important issue and they'll, They'll put some uh, effort into it. Turned out later that Maloney effort to the point of he got on the Ag Committee, which was something even I didn't expect him to do. I was kind of very, very pleased with that. So someone in my email list, one of the farmers, sent my thing on to Nan Hayworth's office. And her, not her, um, not her um, campaign person, she had, she had a spokesperson, a campaign spokesperson, and a congressional spokesperson. The congressional spokesperson was a guy named Terrence Michos. Um, he responded, and he sent out an email to my, my list, basically attacking me. And it really, it was, it was kind of gross what he did. Now, what's funny is, if you know, I don't know if, you know, anybody know Terrence Michos? He used to be a news guy, too, in uh, Channel 62 and stuff like that. Anybody know him at all, know of him? Michos is famous because there's a movie directed by a guy named uh, Walter Hill who directed the uh, Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte film, 48 Hours. His movie he did before that, his famous movie, was a movie called The Warriors. I don't know if you ever saw it or not. It's a great movie. It's a, it's a stylized gang movie. If you haven't seen it, actually get it. It's a great movie. Terrence Michos played the character Vermin in it. He's one of the Warriors, and his nickname in The Warriors is, the, is Vermin. So I responded to Michos' email, and I just basically, and I kept calling him Vermin, throughout the email. Now Vermin said this and Vermin said that. <laughs> and I went through and, and he told a lot of BS lies in it, in his email. But basically I made the point that, you know, this is, this is designed to educate this person running and anybody else of what our damage is and what we need. Um, and then I actually I did two subsequent emails to, each, to Vermin's, uh, he never responded back. And what he did was, I made a comment in there. It was like, what he did was a major no-no. He's not supposed to, he was not supposed to do that as a congressional um, spokesperson. Um, that was, uh, the guy, the, the uh, campaign guy was, um, um, he's on the, uh, with uh, the Blaze, with, with uh, the entity that's owned by, uh, with, with uh, uh, what's their names? Uh, Ben Shapiro and all that. It's, uh, his name, Michael Knowles. Michael Knowles was one of the guys that's on there. I won't say much, but he was the, 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 uh, the campaign one. Now, this is the case with him. I, with her, I was prepared to burn a bridge because she was not in any way helpful. She, was a no, she was a, had no need or no desire to be helpful, and nothing was to be gained by it. So I dubbed her Hurricane Hayworth and Maloney. And I, had a, I wrote a large op-ed in, in the local paper in, in Goshen, the Chronicle, uh, the Farm Bureau president at the time wrote this piece defending her or praising her, and I wrote a response. They gave me a, a full page to go through and dis dismantle his piece and dismantle her, and, which I did. And then I had a phrase in it that said, she let us drown in the mud, which Maloney used during the campaign. And I think it was one of the reasons why he won. But that was a case of where I had no problem burning that bridge because there was nothing to be gained by it. She was not going to do anything ever to help. Farm Bureau. So Farm Bureau on a state level certainly lobbies for Farm Bill stuff. Uh, and then there's American Farm Bureau Federation, which is all of them work together again, AFDF, the national one. 
probably has more interest in the big five than maybe necessarily what goes on here in New York. Um, but they are a voice and they are officially the lobbyists. Right. So the Farm Bureau annual meeting locally in Orange County, actually for many of the counties, occurs in October and maybe early November in an effort to have just that happen. Have those running for office all show up and actually sometimes it gets a little, you know, yeah, a little crazy in there because everybody shows up to say their piece. Um, those that are uh, the, 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 in the, those in office and those running for the same seats, it can get a little feisty. Yeah. So they do that on purpose, but they're a lobbying organization. That is their job. And I recommend all of you belong to your lobbying organizations, whatever they are, uh, and or Farm Bureau. I see a hand. Yeah. Well, if, if, if Farm to Food Bank get in, that would be one thing because that, along with Nourish, is, it opens up a huge market for specialty crop producers. And it, it, I mean, again, it's a market you can't get access to people with, with no money so, or limited resources. So it's a huge, huge market. That's one. Um, obviously, with, um, there still needs to be massive changes or uh, modifications with crop insurance. There's, there's, there's huge problems with it. Uh, that's, a, that's a systemic problem. Um, there's just, I, I, when I go down to DC, I usually typically have a meeting with the RMA administrator and um, with people at RMA in, in DC. Uh, the policies are written by um, staffers in Kansas City, and they have a mindset that's just, I can't explain, but it's not, they're not focused on what's best for the farmer. I wonder if, I was thinking with propping for a small farm, you know, like that maybe, I wonder if more of like funding for like risk mitigation practices, you know, things like, you know, cover, you know, like, right. um, you know, like netting, like maybe some apples or wind, you know, things that, that would protect a crop if you can't get affordable insurance. But they, they need to, I mean, they make, there's like, there's, a, there's an aspect of the policy that's in the MPCI policy that applies also to NAP, which is a provision called production account. And it's basically where whatever you salvage from your crop is deducted from your indemnity. At a greater rate than yeah. you pay. Which violates the statute, which is based. We actually sued the USDA back in the 90s over the federal crop insurance program. They, we have, I have a proposal to modify it. If they were to do that, it would make it infinitely more valuable. That's one thing. Trade is another thing. I mean, I know that one of the issues that um, I worked on recently as well is um, trade issues in particular. And this affects a, a lot of us. Um, well, we've been dealing with onions, and not just onions, a whole bunch of different commodities on the eastern seaboard is dumping from Canada. Mexico too, but Canada has been doing ex excessive amount of dumping. Uh, matter of fact, that's what knocked me out basically of the onion business in 2019 was excessive Canadian dumping. That's been going on since NAFTA. And potato farmers in the Northeast as well as, so Canadians don't dump milk into the United States, but currently there is a trade issue that's being fought a bit, that's part of the um, Mexico-Canada-US trade agreement that Canada is supposed to take a certain amount of product from the U.S. and they just haven't been. It's part of the agreement and they haven't been. And so, so they're just not, because they have a quota system. So their farmers get to, they, they buy shit, they have shares to sell so much milk. They can't make any more. So basically, and then their milk is very expensive and to the consumer, they, it, you know, people can live on milking 50 cows or 60 cows, that's how Canada wants it. But in turn, they're protecting their high price by not letting any product in from any other countries. And actually New Zealand is complaining about the same thing for Canada. So trade on both sides, not only what they send here, but what they're not taking is absolutely, now not, 
somewhat a farm bill issue, but a trade issue. Um, farm bill, I would also say that the two things that I mentioned that I think New York State has done very well, which by the way, New York State had farm bill listening sessions and they're all available through the Department of Ag and Markets, has them on their website. So you can go listen. I was at the one in um, New Paltz last July. It was definitely warm weather. Um, two things New York does very well, like Chris, you know, nourish that could become farm to food bank. That would be phenomenal. And two, again, not really farm bill, but they could work it in there, is farm, um, uh, farm to school. So New York State's 30%, where the school gets extra money if they buy 30% local food, that should be a national pro program. That absolutely should just be a thing. And uh, how they figure it out, you know, maybe they give the states the money and the state figures it out. You know, they reimburse New York for what, like, New York's been doing is tell all the other states, here's a, here's a model. It doesn't have to actually come. And I want to mention crop insurance. So my opinion on crop insurance is that in a national effort to outsource a lot of stuff, you know, that seems to be the smart thing to do, get somebody else to do your work, risk management no longer actually administers the crop insurance program. They used to. It really would be, uh, you had a disaster, you went to FSA, Farm Services Agency, part of USDA, they wrote you the check for your disaster. Now there's, an, there's insurance companies in the middle that have every reason to not write you that check. And so it seems like every little reason is found to take money off that check, to take money off that check. Meanwhile, USDA has actually paid the premium, or the vast majority of the premium for the farmer to that insurance company. So outsourcing that kind of thing has been. It was, it was all part of when, uh, during the Clinton administration, the reinventing government and the public-private partnership crap, which is what it comes down to. And there's no, so, yeah, there's no free money really in USDA anymore. I mean, other than the, the appropriations that we just mentioned, the, uh, the coronavirus, uh, what was CFAP. That? CFAP mm -hmm. payments, those were you know specialty stuff. Dairy farmers now no longer just get payments for the price. There used to be a price floor, and if the milk price was below that floor, they'd get a payment to make that up to a certain point. Really lar large herds, there was, only, there was a maximum amount of payment every business could get in a year. So really large herds maybe went through their payment in two months, whereas really tiny herds would get a payment all year long. So that now they have to pay a premium to get an insurance for that, that's called um, margin protection program. So it's a, a, a formula based on the price of feed and the price of milk and where the margin is. So they don't even, even if they pay the premium, they might not even get paid. If the milk price, price of milk is high or the price of feed is low, they just don't get a payment. Meanwhile, they, it, whether they made money or not or any of that kind of stuff. So that's also now, it's all an insurance policy in one way or another. There is no free, I mean, that that's like the big rural legend, right? That there's money to farm. Oh, yeah. Everybody, you know how many calls a month I get for like, how do I get this money to farm? I'm a new farmer and I wanna sign up for this, you know, like somebody's gonna buy me, you know, animals or a barn or land, no. No, none of that happens. It's just, it's all figured out in the farm bill and the farm bill over the last, particularly the last three, or four has stepped away from direct payments to farmers and stuff like that. That it's just. That's why I went to. Well, I went to basically the, um, the, bulk, the bulk of the payments over the years when there were payments went to apart from con some conservation programs and the subsidies for crop insurance went to the the the, um, the uh, program with from the program crops of the great you know, corn, wheat, uh, oils, uh, oil seeds, cotton, and rice are basically the ones that got the payments. Uh, a, a funny story right before we got the. Uh, $10 million, my wife and I had a meeting with um, a guy named Hank Moore, who at the time was chief of staff of the Ag Appropriations Subcommittee on the majority side, the Republican side, and, the, um, uh, and then Congressman Gilman's LD. And during the meeting, I kind of was voicing that complaint, the fact that, you know, typically fruit and vegetable farmers get very little federal assistance, we get very little help, 
it goes to this, these props mainly and that's it and the public has this perception otherwise. And the, sta Hank, the chief of staff for the Ag Approach Subcommittee says to me, why is that? Why do they get all the help and you guys don't? And I kind of, I laughed a little bit and I looked at him and I said, well, it goes back to the 1938 and the, Ag the Parity Act, the Ag Adjustment Act, and those were the crops at the time were codified. And I gave him a little thumbnail in two minutes of the history of the farm bill. When we left the meeting, I turned to Gilman's LD and I said, was that guy yanking my chain? Was this like a quiz? I mean, you know, he's chief of staff for the Ag Approach Subcommittee. He says, no, he says, you know more about it than he does. There's no institutional memory in that sense. He says, he just writes the checks, he has no clue. And that's the thing you have to always run the assumption too. Now go uh, about the trade. We've been dealing, like I said, we've been dealing with dumping um, for years, going back especially since NAFTA. And just, not just, you know, all types of commodities, all regions, uh, east of the Mississippi. I've talked to producers in Vineland, New Jersey. I've talked to producers in Maine. I've talked to producers in Michigan. All the same story. Once their crop comes in, tip quite often, Canada will come in, will go below their, their price, quite often below the cost of production, and we'll be at a low price until they, their, mar their inventory is cleared out and then the price goes up. And if you go on the, on the uh, Canadian markets and see what they're out of, out of their um, terminal markets, what they're reporting, it's much higher than what they're selling for when, when their stuff is coming here, whether the commodity may be, which is the definition of dumping. And I've been complaining about it for years. And when I was down in 2019, I actually had a meeting with uh, Schumer's uh, staffer when he was minority leader in, in the capital. And he said, and I actually, at one, at one point, I had a meeting with Canadian, at the Canadian Embassy in D.C. about it. And a Canadian uh, staffer says, what do you think's happening here? I said, I think the government is, is providing some uh, improper subsidies. Yeah, including paying for the trucking, the transportation, which would be a violation of WTO and NAFTA. He said, oh, no, we would never do that. Well, then how are you doing it? How are you getting your agricultural products into my market thousands of miles away when we have similar costs of production? What's your magic? Well, I'll get back to you. I'm still waiting on it. So Chuck Stafford said to me, well, it can't just be me complaining. It has to be more than it has to be ag organization. So uh, I, got, I got Farm Bureau involved, New York Farm Bureau, and New York State Vegetable Growers, and the National Onion Association, who all wrote letters requesting that the ITC, the National Trade Commission, or Commerce, Department of Commerce, look into those are two avenues which you could file trade complaints um, into, uh, uh, into seeing what exactly is happening. And in doing research, I found some uh, some insurance products that were really questionable. Matter of fact, when I sent the descriptions of them to Gillibrand's um, legislative director, Canadian insurance. Canadian insurance. Her response was, "Whoa, this is not WTO compliant." But it's it's a lot like you know, if a tree falls in a forest, does it make a sound? If no one complains about whatever the practice is, they're going to continue to get away with it. The problem we have is, to file a trade complaint, you have to be commodity or crop specific. So you. you what Canada is doing, and I believe they're also subsidizing the trucking, it's not, it's not commodity specific. They're doing it across the board. They're doing it all kinds of types of commodities. Like growers locally would complain the same. The same thing. And so it's very difficult to file an individual trade complaint based on commodity. A few years ago, the Michigan uh, tart cherry growers filed a complaint against Turkey. They were being, Turkey was dumping into their markets. And Everyone that looked at it, including I think it was, it was done through ITC, I believe, um, initially said it was, a, it was a righteous complaint. They had a really good complaint. Cost them something like, I don't know, something, I think like two or three million dollars to hire a lawyer to, to do the complaint. You don't have to have a lawyer, but obviously it, it helps to do it. And they, and they paid like two or three million dollars for legal fees to file a complaint. In the end, um, they were ruled against by ITC. And, you know, there's, there's U.S. air bases in Turkey. Which is going to make it difficult. Right. So this is officially but, we're going to move on. Really, but this is, I just want to finish right, one, one right. second. I just want to finish one second. Sure. What we need to do, what needs to be done is, and this is one thing I've been trying to do a lot, hopefully a lot before, is that it needs to be changed as far as how you file or initiate a trade complaint. It should not be based on the commodity. It should be based on the practice of the offending country. So, because I don't think there's actually an asper, I don't know if there is an asparagus or a cilantro grower association. I mean, there may be, but I'm, I don't know if there is, you know. Asparagus, yes. Probably not. So, so it's hard to marshal that complaint and that support. But if the complaint would be able to be done on the practice that the offending country is doing, then it'd be a lot easier to get other different parties and such involved in different areas to initiate the complaint and make it a lot easier. That's something I think that could be done in the farm bill. 
because in, in, in the uh, in the trade sec in the trade title. Great. So awesome. Thank you so so much. Um, you know, both for your commentary, for your instruction. If we can get just a round of applause for Liz and Chris and Mary. Um, we're gonna we're gonna do Q and A. Thanks. Thank you, Susie, for kicking it off. Um, I'm gonna, Chris. Actually, can oh. I take that lapel yep. from? Great. And if you all can share that, yep. um, mostly for you know the video here. So I'm just gonna ask folks if you have a question. I'm gonna pass you this little tiny microphone. Um, well, this is just for the video. The viewers. That will be Hi. Thank you very much. My name is Jonathan Farber. I'm a farmer in Greene County. And I'm a former legislative assistant for Senator Howard Metzenbaum. There you go. Oh, really? No, yes, okay. I am. Oh, cool. And I'd like to re-ask the question that was asked. Uh, it's interesting that the question was, what are the things we can worry about as small farmers in the Hudson Valley? And the answer that I got, or that I heard, was securing a market for product in the state and then international trade. So I'd like to hear maybe three other items. and then. One of the issues that's interesting to me when you think about the s securing a state market has a lot to do with the international market as well. And my understanding is that the big five will not like it because of commerce clause issues. And will argue that one state can't discriminate against another state in terms of where they source their materials. And that usually kills everything. So. What, one thing I, would, I was thinking about, and this is one of the proposals I had, is um, there needs to be more, um, there needs to be more research and, 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 and available to producers as far as for outlets. Uh, I know that in my case, when I grew onions, when that onion left my loading dock, I know I went to a local repacker, but after that, where, how it went to get to eventually to the, to the grocery store, I couldn't tell you and what the process was. Also, I knew I had the seven or eight people that I sold to locally, the repackers, but as far as apart from that, I didn't know who else, where else to go to sell my product. So one of the things I proposed was for, one was ER, for ER, now ERS has been gutted by the Trump administration, hopefully it'll be, it'll be reconstituted and people will be brought back to DC. Economic research service. But for uh, ERS to do a study on, uh, take a couple of crops as far as what the process is to get from the farm to the grocery store. More information like that would enable a producer to make better decisions as far as how to market their stuff. And also, there should be, there should be um, a, an avenue, either a, a website or like that would that enables a grower. Okay, I have this and this and this to sell. Where could I sell it to? Let me go online and see, and who are the, the people available or outlets available that I can sell the product to. Also, we need more accurate price reporting too. When I would sell onions, the, there was, the, there was a um, AMS, Agricultural Marketing Service, has a, a weekly or a, a daily, actually, a, a market report for onions and potatoes. And they also have for other, all, everything, everything they have. And they have a weekly trend report. And it says what the price is being done in, or being sold for in the terminal markets across the country. But when I would go to um, and sell to a local repacker and say, like, I would see, like, um, Onions coming in from Idaho were $8 a bag, and then the freight I knew, I could, I could look up another thing at AMS and see the freight was $6 a bag, and was $14 coming in. I'd say, oh, the price should be $14 to me. And the packer would say, oh no, I bought from so-and-so down the road for $10, not 14 And I have no way of verifying that yeah. at all. I would, I would, and yeah. So like one of the things I propose is, there should be, at the point of sale, and this is, you're talking, this is more, this is not obviously in a, in a farmer's market situation, but this is on a com more of a, a wholesale commercial level. At the point of sale, that buyer should have to upload that sales ticket or sales routine or that information up to a website that USDA would keep. That then the farmer can go and look and see and verify what actually they paid for, that they paid for the product. Because then if I knew that they actually paid so-and-so this much money, it helps me make a better decision of what I should sell my, my product for. And uh, when I, I pitched this to, um, uh, uh, she was staffer for the Judiciary Committee, um, and she said it was kind of like similar to the uh, uh, meat uh, packer uh, reporting, it would be similar to. But like right now, that doesn't exist. We're in the dark, we as farmers are in the dark. We're in the dark as far as who to sell to, 
we're in the dark as far as how what the process is when it leaves our dock, and we're in the dark as far as you know what the you know what happens as far as where, where it goes, and what the prices of what the prices are. I have a couple of things that are specifically for the Hudson Valley. So, money, which again infrastructure and other, we've gotten a little bit, but money for animal product processing. Absolutely not, you know, there's not enough. We have a new plant opening in Sullivan County for beef, maybe other small animal, and definitely chicken probably in the next beef supposed to open this month, and then chicken later this year for sure. Uh, and they'll be taking like 50 animals a day, which is pretty good for this area. So that's great. Um, and not just money for new plants, we need money to help the old plants either expand and or stay compliant because as we all know, compliance gets harder every minute. Um, and so that, and, and dairy processing for sure, you know, fluid milk, cheese, whatever it is. So not just meat, we want the other animal products too. Uh, you know, we have almost no uh, egg production in the Hudson Valley anymore. I mean, we have it little. We don't have the big guys. We don't have those those bigger. So if, I, I would say, processing and packaging, there's a little bit of egg packaging, but mostly it's somebody putting individual eggs in a carton from their individual chickens. There's not a lot of um, big guys anymore. They were all out of business. So, um, and then uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into this, but I'm going to say labor. I don't know how it's going to get fixed, but it is absolutely a problem. And even if you can find labor, you have a hard time housing them. Yeah, actually, that was what I was going to say if I were to say programs to specifically um, think about for the Farm Bill. I mean, labor is certainly, accessing labor is an issue, but I even find, you know, a lot of the, even small farmers, vegetable farmers I work with in, around the region are starting to look at H-2A as an option. Um, it's been nice that USDA has put some more resources about the program up there that I think, you know, they're not bad, but, you know, to go and figure out how to apply for H-2A, to, to do all the paperwork, to you know, manage all the paperwork that you need to do. Um, and, and I know people who do it with two, and they're, they're great, but these are people who are really high-capacity um, sort of administrators. You know, like they, and I think that having, you know, some either, you know, through rural development or some technical assistance program, you know, to either have somebody who can be a liaison to help people figure out the paperwork or to um, provide cost share for better record keeping software and training for that. Um, just, you know, I, I have, I'm seeing people who I'm really concerned about just as they start to try to scale up, you know, even if they can pay the labor, like the, the all of the administration around that is a, a really large added cost and if it's done poorly, a really huge risk. Um, and, and then when you get into H-2A, I mean, you know you're going to be looked at by the and federal. You have to house them. And you have to house them. And so, and USDA, you know, the state, both the state and USDA, I would say the resources that they have for um, ag labor housing are, you know, you know, they're, they're low interest, I mean, zero interest loans, but it's not. For new small farmers, that's. Yeah. Small farmers who I deal with don't even have their own house because they bought, you know, they bought a piece of a bigger farm. That original farm family is still living in the main house. They sold off all the other houses that were part of that, you know, as they collected and bought up over the years. There is no place for even the new farmer to live, more or less. The farm. Well, and, and and there's a lot of farms that are renting the land. I mean, they can't put farm labor housing up on the land that they're renting, you know. So I think having more federal, you know, maybe through USDA rural development funding for, um, you know, congregate, you know, like or HUD or, yeah. I mean, well, I'm thinking farm bill, so it wouldn't be through HUD, right? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's funding for, like, either community housing for ag labor or something I think would be a huge help. What, 
Orange County had, had a, I don't know if it's still functioning, had a great program through HUD. Because Orange County was designated a HUD County, we had a, we had a program, the Farm Worker Housing Improvement Program, that was a, a matching grant program. It was a federal matching grant for improvement, either up, upgrading or eventually new construction, too. Yeah, there was two uh, pockets, CBD, CGBD money, yep. and how, coal yeah. money? But, but that funding funds. is only for renovation. You couldn't build new. No, they were, they were using the building. Well, well, we were allowed to buy trailers. To replace yeah. existing yeah. Right. housing. Right. You could not build right. something new from scratch. Right. So, that, right, so trailers, yeah. and actually in Orange County, as long there as was you trash a, a, yeah. a trailer so builder who worked specifically with Orange County Department of uh, Rural yeah. de uh, uh, development. Community Development to build them to spec yeah. for the, to, qua to meet all of the state and federal requirements for square foot per person and well, windows per person. 25, uh, program, yeah. 75 yeah. Yep. And a matter of fact, you can't, if once you do it, you're locked in where you cannot use it for anything else for a certain period of time. It was five years. Five years. But they to. still had to meet the income requirement. They had to be, they had to, you know, be below a certain income level to qualify. 75-25 matching grant. The federal government pays 75%. But I will say, we're not doing it anymore because I think some of these things started getting in the way. Orange County hasn't distributed that kind of money in what, I think three years because the rules change, so that might be part of it. First of all, thank you so much for this really educational overview of the Farm Bill. It's daunting if you just start reading about it on your own, so to have you demystify it to this extent is really great. Um, I'm Sarah Brannon, for those of you who don't know. Uh, my question is about crop insurance again. and we've seen over the past several years a lot of droughts in the western part of the country all the way to the middle of the country in a lot of the states that have large quantities of those top five crops so wheat um, small grains corn etc but then here on the east coast i know from some of the climate researchers at cornell that what we are likely to experience due to climate change is less about drought per se, persistent drought, and more about um, swings between periods of drought and then severe weather events and severe rainfall. <laughs> so my question is about what in the farm bill can support farmers to adapt to this new climatological reality? And is there anything that can be done for small to mid-sized farmers here in the Hudson Valley because just by inherently the farms here are smaller than they are in Kansas or the Dakotas. So are small to medium farmers here in New York accessing crop insurance? And if they are, is there anything that we can do to leverage the crop insurance system to shore up our farms in the Hudson Valley against these wild fluctuations in weather patterns? It, it all comes down to, again, how the policies are written, especially in terms of the uh, MPCI policy, which is the primary policy used by um, most farmers in this area, and it's the basis for how NAP is done. And then later, when they used to do supplemental disaster relief programs, it was structured on the same, same uh, uh, framework as well. Again, they, they write these, po when we sue the USDA, our, our lawyer referred to them as a shell game. And basically the way they write these policies, they write it in such a way so as you get as minimal as much as possible. And a few years ago, the House um, Ag Committee did a, did a whole thing on shallow losses and why shallow losses were such a problem, where you have these, loss, these, these minimal losses and you, you, you get no payment. You'd be paying into the crop insurance program and get nothing back as far as indemnities. Again, it's the way the policies are written, and in particular, production account. The, and in, in terms of also some other policies, including the onion policy, with the exception of Orange County, because we got a provision to kick it out, we have a thing called stage production guarantee. And stage production guarantee is, based, the way it works is, you only get a percentage of your policy based on the growth stage of the plant that's in. So it, from, the, from the point of planting to two leaves in terms of onions, you get, you get 35% coverage, and then from two leaves to eight leaves, you get 
you know, uh, 60% and then from eight leads to the way you get, you get 100%. It's absurd because, and this is what I, when they were evaluating at the point I made in, in the evaluation team that USDA hired, that's basically a cost of production uh, policy. Because the argument they made for is you only have so much invested in the crop at that point. And my response was, yeah, but you're not rating the premiums based on cost of production. You're rating the premiums based on technically on what's supposed to be the value of the crop. You can't have it both ways. You can't, you can't rate it on that and then turn around and have it be based on what you think is, think is the cost of production. We, because of political pressure, were able to get a exemption for stage production guarantee um, for, or for Orange County or New York State for the, the policy, but it exists in other parts of the country and in other crops. Of course, it doesn't exist in the corn, wheat. They don't have stage production guarantee, corn, wheat, cotton, rice, oil seeds. They don't have it because they had the political muscle to keep it out. Um, the policies need to be, they need to be revamped or uh, looked at and written in a way in which that it doesn't, that they actually provide um, real assistance. The, the, when I always, when I would go down and talk to these people at RMA, the, the, I always, I don't know if you've ever seen, there was a uh, HBO movie based on Randy Schiltz's book done on the early days of AIDS and the band played on. I don't know if you've ever seen the, the movie on it, but in the movie there's a scene where the CDC researcher comes across case number one or zero. He's the, he's the um, gay um, uh, Canadian uh, flight attendant. And as he's interviewing him, the, 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 the flight attendant is jerking the guy around. And the, and the CDC researcher says to him, help me or don't help me, but don't F with me. And that's what I would say to these people at USDA. If you want to, you know, help me or don't help me. Don't write these policies that are shell games that don't do anything and make you feel good. Write policies in which that they do act and pay out. And they, read my testimony, you'll see in which how my, you know, solution for production account is. If you change production account that we suggest, get rid of the stage production guarantee and make sure the established market price is, a, is which is the basis for establishing the value of the, whatever the commodity is, is a fair price. Because it used to be for the onion policy, when we, when we were hitting 96, um, and we had a meeting with, with Secretary Glickman in 98 about it in, in the Capitol. Um, they used to value the onions at, um, for the crop insurance at like, uh, I think it was like, it was $2.91 for a 50 pound bag. And then I, we showed this to, to Glickman, and then we pulled out to get a loan from USDA at the time, they valued onions at like $16 a bag. <laughs> I said, if you, if you did this for buying a car, you'd be, you'd be put in jail. You know, you value the car in terms of like the loan at $30,000 car, but in terms of insurance at $5,000, they'd arrest you. I, this is insane. So you have to make sure that those, those prices are at what legitimately what they should be at, not at something absurdly low, which undervalues the, the fig. So I'm going to, um, cause you asked about climate change and it, um, one, every producer I know that's been farming forever and a day will admit that we used to get an inch of rain once a week. Now we get three inches of rain once every three weeks and that, that it comes in an hour and it doesn't stick around, that it, that how precipitation falls has absolutely changed in the well, last hey, 30 years. I have a block of land that um, I've been hit by hail on. I was hit like five times over like a seven year period when my dad's cousin farmed that land for 40 years before that he was never hit once. Yeah, so um, research, Research on varieties, types, things that are, will do better here, and conservation program stuff to help slow the water down, whether it's um, cover crops or crops around the edges of fields to slow the water down, to keep it in the field. Anything that is going to work, well, crop rotations that will help add the organic matter to the soil so that it acts like a bigger sponge, all those kinds of things that we can react to to sort of slow down what seems like a, a, a lot that's changed in the last 30 years, in term, particularly in terms of precipitation and temperature, you know, sw slightly wilder swings for us with temperature. Again, not as bad as other countries or certainly even on, on the Midwest this last summer. For sure. So those would be the two areas that would be covered by the Farm Bill research and conservation programs that specifically address this. 
Actually, I was thinking, because um, I'm just doing a, a study looking at um, the whole farm revenue insurance in NAP, and one thing that's really, you can't get NAP data. Like, you can't get data on how much they've paid out. You can't get da NAP data on the price. Like, you can get, like, if, for, like, standard crop insurance, I can get data on, like, the indemnities and how much was paid out and NAP is not existing program through FSA. Follows the model of the NPCI policy. Yeah, but you still like. Right, but you don't. You're right. They don't give the data. They don't give the data out. Right. So you have no idea whether NAP's a good deal or a bad deal for farmers. Like none. Like when farmers say, "Well, I don't think NAP is worth it," I'm like, "Well, you know, I don't know because I don't have any data either." So, you know, NAP is interesting because for a lot of small crops, you know, that with the crop insurance program, they require it to be actuarially sound, and so with, you know, and it's, so it's really hard for a lot of these little, like, vegetable and fruit crops to have actuarially sound policies in areas that aren't major producers at, a, you know, at a, at a scale of these crops, and so, you know, whereas NAP isn't an actuarially sound program. Like, that's not, it's, it's basically you, you pay a payment and you get insurance. That's a constant thing, by the way. USDA always says, you know, the crop insurance is the actuarially sound. And my response always to that is farming is an actuarially sound. Right. <laughs> yeah, so. Stop jerking each other off here. But it's. Make it something that's going to be, you know, realistically it helps. But what's interesting is so with NAP, you pay like a flat payment, you know, regardless of like, you know, it's, it's you know, it's just, it is what it, you know, it is what it is, but you don't know whether. It's, you know, whereas with the, you know, we were comparing sometimes some of the, the trying to compare NAP to some of the, the areas like, you know, some of the tomatoes and stuff. In some areas you can actually have crop insurance. You know, in some cases the crop insurance might be a better deal because of all the subsidies and, you know, and, and it really isn't that risky there or whatever. The NAP is, but you can't get NAP data unless you, like, Freedom of Information Act it. Hmm. So I would just say making information more transparent like that would be a lot of would help growers know whether or not that program actually, I think for a lot of growers, NAP probably for some of their crops would make sense, but it's hard for me to, to talk about that with any real conviction because I, honestly, it's really hard to get the data. So that's one. One more question. Yeah, we have time for one more question and then we're gonna. Oh, no more hands. Are we done? Oh, there we go. I'll give you anybody who wants my card, and if you have any questions, you want to contact me. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Any happy time. to fill your email box. <laughs> yep, absolutely. I, I asked for that, and I got 36 emails. <laughs> Transparent. So I just want to throw something at the wall here, kind of. Um, my name's Taylor Reed. I'm a faculty member at the Culinary Institute of America, and I worked um, in 2008 and 2012 on beginning farmer issues in the farm bill. And we were very successful with set-asides within those programs. We were able to increase the amount of funding for beginning farmer programs by including a, a set-aside for veterans in the beginning farmer program. Um, and we were able to get beginning farmer set-asides into a lot of uh, the, um, the FSA loan programs. I'm just wondering, and this might be a, a totally crazy idea, has anybody ever tried to put set-asides for small farmers or specialty crop farmers in some of the bigger farm bill programs? Could we have a set-aside for uh, farmers under 20 acres within the conservation program? I mean, I think there are, pro like, there's certainly some... There are loan programs. What do you mean by set aside? So set aside meaning that a, a certain percentage of the money for the program is set aside meaning a certain percentage for the program is allocated to a particular group of farmers. So in, I can't remember exactly what the numbers are, but in the beginning farmer and rancher development program, I think it's a 5% set aside specifically for, um, for uh, veteran farmers. And whether that's the number of uh, projects that they fund or the total allocation, I, I would have to go back. I can't, it's a long time ago now. But there are set-asides within a, a number of programs for particular groups of farmers. There is, but it doesn't, I mean, especially block grant programs. Mm -hmm. well, like, start at the federal level, get handed out by the state as a matter of, of states. 
plural, and that's specifically for specialty crops, but it doesn't go to farmer typically. There might be a little bit that, so I know some of the specialty crop and some of the other, um, some federal money does trickle into the state, which helps pay for the orga you know, organic certification reimbursement, GAPS recertification reimbursement, those kinds of things. Little, little pieces can go to individual producers. But and transferring and, to that organic too, I didn't know if Well, that, yeah, that, those, right, transferring to organic, that kind of, the, the funds for that start at the feds, go through the state typically. And, but, well, like, so well, no, like, like the rural business enterprise, like the one that does the energy, rural business energy one, that USDA, that one has, if you're doing like a small loan, a small project, you get to apply first in October. Big projects can't apply then. And then in January, small and big projects can apply. So the, the smaller projects have the first crack at the money and then they, they open it up. You know, so they, there are some programs that do that, but it's more like scale of project rather than like based on like being limited resource or. FSA and farm credit, which farm credit money gets authorized mm -hmm. in the farm bill, correct, right? So even though farm credit's a private bank, they get to borrow money at a particularly low, low rate but have to loan to farmers. So both FSA, um, the loaning, the loan portion, not the other wallet portion, and farm credit have loans specifically for new farmers and small farmers mm -hmm. and young farmers. Actually, both of them have these tiny, I mean, I mean, I don't know what you can do this, what are the $5,000 or something like that for some of those, the little FSA one, that's for like teenagers to start their own little, for, seriously, start their own little thing off of mom and dad's business, but it's a start. Um, th those do exist, but again, they're relatively small and whether they're terribly effective or not. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think the first I cut. I mean, sort of a bigger strategy for yeah. helping to get money to small and specialty crop producers to be certified. So one of the things you can cross your fingers for, well, some of it's settled already, so on those, on the House and Senate Ag Committees and Subcommittees. Cross your fingers for Georgia, California, Florida, Michigan, uh, Massachusetts. The other states are a lot like New York. And then fewer, Pennsylvania, fewer, Iowa, Dakota, Montana, that are single, even Texas is not in our best interest, even though they're pretty broad, they have a lot of acres in the big five. Um, so California is, our, our, you know, a, when somebody comes from California, it's a good, that's a good, good reflection for us. We might have our problems with California in terms of marketing and them sending product to this side of the country and sort of undermining our prices, but for policy, they are just a big version of New York with I don't know, tropical stuff. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm thinking, I'm keep thinking about your the set aside question. And I think the first thing would be like for a lot of programs, you know, you'd want to know are there programs where smaller businesses like you're talking about are, are not able to access the money because they can't compete because it runs out before, you know, I mean, like they, they just, it runs out or their, their applications aren't good enough. For some grant programs, the, the way they do the set aside is they have a different pool for smaller asks and people are only competing in that smaller pool and as a grant reviewer that's where I see a lot of those projects you know that are not quite you know you know that um, at that level but but on the other hand if you're a smaller producer and you want a lot of money right like you don't want you know some twenty five thousand dollar grant you want a four hundred thousand dollar grant you know, you're not usually operating in the set aside pool at that point. You're 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 swimming with the bigger fish. Um, at that point, I think their their issue necess isn't necessarily that they're small. It's that they you know they haven't necessarily hired the technical assistance grant writing that the the larger producers have hired. You know, or so yeah. So you might want to set aside for you know. 
I don't. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'd want to see data. I guess I'd, I'd, I would want to see data that people are competing for those projects and are not able to access the funds. And at that point, I think a set aside project could make sense. But I'm not. I, I don't have the answer, like off the top of my head, whether or not that is a need. So the one thing that popped up, the gentleman asked about the Northeast or at least the Hudson Valley, what land preservation money? I almost forgot about that. So New York State's been pretty generous with PDR dot purchase of development rights dollars, um, but if there was a bigger pool or a more regular pool coming down from the feds or matching from the feds or their own programs, because that has happened in the past, it just has been sort of paltry in the last few years, because we need to protect those acres if we're going to keep farming them, if we're going to make them available to new farmers and smaller farmers, that needs to be at an agricultural land purchase rate, not the $15,000 an acre or whatever that it would cost to put a house on it. So that being said, any last like couple of comments from you guys? Mm -hmm. So yes, both Liz and Chris, I'm sure, are available for any questions. That, and I want to thank all of you. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is two hours out of your time. Appreciate I am pleasantly shocked at the number of you. I really thought there would be like three of us having this conversation. <laughs> so I was like, who wants to come and hear about the Farm Bill for months? But thank you. Thank you for your time, your engagement, your interest in this, whatever that is. And I want to thank these two. Yeah, let's give a time. round of applause for our speakers here. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, and I, I'll include all of your contact info in a follow-up email that I'll send to all of you today. Before you leave, please do scan the QR code. They're on the polls here. They're on the screen up here. Just so we can figure out what comes next. This is a basics. And wow, you guys did such an amazing <laughs> job. Um, and I'm so happy everyone stayed engaged throughout the entirety of our session.